Welcome. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. Thank you for uh, giving up some time on your Sunday to talk through equipment for a Racing the Planet Ultra. Um, just quickly, so I have muted you all. Uh, you can chat to each other in the in the chat group, which it looks like there's quite a lot of chat going on there. Um, so you can introduce each other and also ask questions or provide advice to the others. On this call as well is um, my colleague Rita. Rita is an event director um, at Racing the Planet as well and has been with us uh, more than 10 years, as have I, uh, and she will be there to monitor your, your chat questions. Rita is the event director specifically for the Gobi March this year. Um, my name is Sam, Sam Fanshaw, for those I haven't met or didn't see on the last info call, and I am another event director at Racing the Planet and specifically this um, year I'm responsible for are overseeing the Atacama Crossing and the Last Desert. Um, not all the event managers are on this call because of the timing in different, in different countries. There's also a number of other experienced people on this call that I can see. Um, and for, for those people, so Howard and Charlie and, and Tony, please do um, add your comments in the chat box to answer people's questions. And as I said, offer tips and advice at the end with what the agenda is. So very briefly, uh, on today's call, what I'm gonna cover is the Race and Plan equipment list, what to consider when selecting an item, breaking the items down into four key categories. Uh, we'll talk about how you can go lighter. I will answer some of the, the questions that I get frequently that you may have as questions as well. Um, I'll introduce some resources um, for when you're making selecting equipment, talk about top tips, and then at the end, we'll have a Q and A. So, an hour is not a lot of time to go through um, so much on equipment. So I'll try to keep to schedule. The Q&A may well go over and I'm not able to go through every item in great detail um, for that reason. But again, I'm happy to answer your questions either afterwards on this call or um, in a separate call we can set up or, or on email, you can email across any questions that you do have. So let's start with the Racing the Planet equipment list. It is similar for all of our races, except for the last desert. It's not exactly the same, so make sure you check the specific one for you. And there are some of the items where you will need to make, make different selections based on the race that you're doing. So depending on the climate and the terrain in particular, and it's normally the roving race that has most differences um, or most differences you want to consider. So in today's call, I am going to be talking generically um, and I'll allow people to comment and I will comment on some items you may want to think about more specifically for um, a specific race. There's 35 items on most of the equipment list, between 32 and 37, I think it is, depending on the race. And it seems quite daunting, but that is everything from shoes to toilet paper and everything in between. It's also 10 pages long, but if you just want one to keep it simple, the first page is just a simple list of all of the items. The next seven pages is more detail on each of the mandatory items, including pictures, notes, recommended makes and models, etc. And the final two pages are the recommendations of optional items if you are going to bring anything in addition to the mandatory items. Mentioned earlier, it may be worth going to have a look at the equipment list um, now if you don't have it in front of you or if you haven't looked at it for a while, because we'll be referring to a lot of items that, that are on it and I think you may find it helpful. You can download it from, from um, our website, from any of the event websites. Here at the bottom, I've got the one for the Atacama Crossing. You can replace Atacama Crossing with Gobi March, Namibres, Georgia uh, or similar to look at one for a specific race. And on the website, you'll see it looking like this. You can download it from that button or there is a picture uh, and, a, and a, um, a picture of each item with also a statement of what that item is. So it should be quite, quite helpful and quite self-explanatory for you, but there is a lot. But here's the first page of the equipment list, just simply 35 items listed down. So that basically is what you need to bring. However, we do have also seven pages where each of the equipment item is listed in more detail with a picture, a make and a model. And the final two pages is based hey, on optional that items. Hey, okay, you've also got on each of the items, it looks a bit like this. So here, for example, is the uh, backpack item. 
It says what it is, gives an approximate size, the quantity that you need to, to bring it in, uh, and then some, some ideas of makes and models that you might want to consider. It doesn't mean these are the ones that you have to, to use. You can use other types as well, but these are ones that other people have used before in the races uh, and have um, either recommended or considered uh, good to work for the race. And there's a line like that for every single item. But 35 items, 10 pages long an equipment list is quite daunting. So just wanting to break it down. So I break it down into key items of which there are only five. Um, and these are the items which if you get it wrong, then they could prevent you finishing the race. If you have a bad pair of shoes, you get blisters, you might not be able to finish. If you have a hydration system that doesn't encourage you to, to drink or that leaks, then that could uh, prevent you finishing the race. There's then also a list of items that need a little extra consideration, um, but are not quite as important as the key items. And there's nine of those. And then I say what we call general items, where there's 21 other items where they are very important. You still have to have them, but they're certainly not in any way as critical in terms of spending the time and research as for the key items. Then in additional under optional items, the, the fourth area to consider, there are some optional items that we do recommend or might recommend that you bring or certainly at least consider bringing. So what I'm trying to do is break it down is that there's four sections to look at rather than just looking at it as there's 35 items, where do I start? And the same things need to be considered when you're looking at choosing every single item. Uh, the first one is what will it be used for? So thinking about everything from, let's say your running tights or your, your running shorts, what will it be used for? It'll be used for running during the day when it, it, may, be, um, it may be hot, it may be that there's gonna be undergrowth, it may be that it's, it's sandy and you wanna think about what, um, what it will be used for and how you can make it relevant to the, the purpose. <laughs> Does it meet the requirement? And that's both in terms of racing the planet specification, which is listed out in the equipment list, and also for you, uh, does it meet the requirement for what it's going to be used for for you personally? Does it does it work or do I know how to work it? So a simple example of that is, say, a compass. Um, you don't need to navigate on our races. All the courses are fully marked. Um, but you do have to carry a compass as an emergency item. And if you had to use it, you want to at least have an idea of how it works. Does it suit the climate? It's extremely important that because your clothing choice, um, for example, and your sleeping bag choice may be quite different depending on what climate you're expecting. You still have to bring that item. Even in the driest desert in the world in the Atacama, you still have to bring a, a rain poncho. Uh, but you may want to go for a lighter weight uh, option for the Atacama compared to uh, a race where it, there is a higher chance of rain. Let's say, for example, the Gobi March, where it doesn't always rain, but it, it's more likely to than the Atacama. And is it the lightest available that suits the purpose? You don't always have to go for the lightest, but the heavier your backpack, the harder the um, race will be. And there is obviously also a cost consideration in there. So is it the lightest available to meet your budget as well? Maybe something that you're considering. But those are five questions that you want to be thinking of when you're making the final decision on every item. Some fundamental information or some basic questions that I am um, always asked that are going to get out of the way early. The first one is how much does the average pack weigh? So on average, a pack will weigh 10 kilos or 22 pounds. And when we talk about pack weight, we're generally talking about it without water, which will add an extra 1.5 kilos that you need to consider for your training. But when we're talking about weight, we don't normally include that and the clothes that you would wear. So it doesn't include your shoes, for example, because uh, you'll be wearing them rather than carrying them. Um, the lightest pack that we've had at any race has been just under six um, kilos, just under 13 pounds. Um, and it is possible to go that light, but you really have to be very stringent on selecting the lightest gear possible. And you're likely to be hungry or cold, not to the extreme, but to the uncomfortable level if you're gonna go that light. So you need to think about whether it's worth it um, or not for an extra half a, uh, half a kilo or, or one kilo. Um, so 
an extra couple of pounds, is it worth it for a little more comfort? And the, I, I highly recommend you don't go above 12 kilos, uh, which is 26 pounds. You can fit everything into a 25 litre pack. Um, if you're just going with the mandatory equipment and the odd optional items, you can fit everything in. When I say in, that might include a little bit with certain items that it's not possible to fit in, but are attached to the outside comfortably with plan to be, not just hung off the outside because you can't fit it in. Uh, it's okay to have a slightly more generous size pack, say a 32 litre pack, but I wouldn't go above that. And it is definitely possible to fit everything into a 22 litre pack. Sorry, a 32 litre pack. Um, something to note more than um, to actually uh, more than as a question is that your pack will have more space and in theory become lighter uh, as you um, go through the race. So if you're struggling to fit everything in on day one, but nearly in um, after day one, you will be able to fit it in. And the final question I'm get, I get asked a lot is. Um, do I really need to bring all of the mandatory items? And the answer is yes. And all of those items will be checked both pre-race at the uh, race check-in and also um, ad hoc throughout the race. If someone's had a particularly light pack, um, then we will do an ad hoc check and for the, the top runners. Okay, starting with the general items, I said there's 21, there's, I've got 20 listed here, actually the patches there's two types of, hence the 21. And you can see them listed out here, you can also see them on the equipment list, but basically you wanna ask those five questions, which I'll um, bring up on the screen again in a moment, to make sure that you're getting the right piece of equipment for, for you and for the race and to make it the lightest possible. But for example, a whistle. Like you could spend days researching a whistle, but at the end of the day, as long as it is one that is, is very loud, is recommended by say a search and rescue organization, or is the one that we recommend, which is a jet screen whistle, then there's only so much that you're going to um, gain by doing more research on it. Um, so when I'm saying this, I'm not saying don't research it, I'm just saying there's small light items that are very important. And if you wanted to get attention of somebody on the course, that's why you have the whistle with you. So you do want it to be loud enough, but beyond being loud and light, that's all you really need to, to know about it. Toilet paper, we could talk in a lot, lot more detail than that, for example, but you actually want to think about in the weeks or even months or even now leading up to the race you're going to be doing is how much toilet paper do you use each time you go to the toilet and then try and look at how much could you survive on and then work out like a daily ration for that but toilet paper is toilet paper it's more looking at the amount of it there that you want to to go through in a little more detail um, but not spending days and days researching just over time working it out and working out what you want. A few specific things that I will say here is the survival bib bibby bag, it has to be a bag, it can't be a blanket. And then the amounts of the alcohol gel and the sunscreen. Alcohol gel, we will always refill it for you, but you have to start with 60 mil and we want you to, to use it generously even before um, COVID came about. The sunscreen, we can help you to refill, but if you are very fair and you know you need more sunscreen, then bring more. These are absolute basic minimum amounts that you need to bring, but consider it whether it fits your use, if it's enough and consider having more. Again, the five questions I'm just putting up on the screen again then, because they apply to everything, even those general items. So when I'm saying bog them in together and, and almost in a way, just go and get them. Um, you should still be asking your question about yourself the question about them is is it does it meet all of these requirements um, for each of those so next we move on to the key items <clears throat> so i put food and electrolytes here in gray not because they're not key they really are key in fact they're so key that they need a separate information session because it would take up the entire time so i'm not going to talk about them too much today except to say that you have to have a minimum of 2000 calories per day, so 14,000 calories. You don't have to eat just 2000 a day. You can have some more calories on one day and slightly less on another day. 
um, but you do need to manage them throughout the week and have an absolute minimum of 14,000. We do recommend uh, a proper, I say proper, like a more like a proper meal in the evenings or, or in the mornings, but at least once a day. Um, and the brand that we would normally recommend for that is Expedition Foods, mainly because they are the lightest calorie to uh, weight ratio and they actually don't taste too bad either. For the electrolytes in the equipment list, it has quite a good description about how to work out how many electrolytes you need to bring based on how long you think it's gonna take you to, to complete each stage. If you have absolutely no idea, then talk, send me an email at info at racingtheplanet.com or ask the uh, event director that you're in touch with anyway, if you've already registered for a race um, and they will be able to help you with that as well. I think probably the next Zoom session I will do will be specifically on food and electrolytes. But we are today gonna to talk about the other three key items, the shoes, the backpack and the hydration system. And by key, I mean they're items that if you don't get them right, they could prevent you finishing the race. Starting with shoes. And I think that I'm talking to an audience that at least does some running and hiking. And so has an idea about um, the type of shoes they like or don't like in general. So I'm not gonna go through the very basics, but specifically for um, the Race in the Planet Ultra you're looking at, the two most important things are comfort and suitability to terrain. And the third most important thing is size. The support cushioning foot mechanics, that's a generic thing for any, any time that you're buying a running or, or hiking shoe. So comfort is the most important thing here, but there is a balance on it. So taking it to the extreme, maybe you love wearing flip-flops uh, and they are your most comfortable shoes at home. Not saying that it's not possible, but it would not be sensible or recommended in any way, shape or form to wear flip-flops in any of the desert races. Um, and therefore that's a way to say it's not good enough. So let's say you're using a road running shoe um, that is very comfortable. Um, maybe it doesn't have so much support or it's got a lot of mesh in it. Um, then it is probably not absolutely suitable for the desert terrain, but you want, can then consider a shoe that's similar to that. So maybe there is a trail version of the same shoe, or maybe you can look up and you will be able to look up a shoe that is a little bit more durable, but is similar to um, the, the shoe that you're wearing that you like. But there's no point in having the perfect shoe for the desert if it gives you blisters. Um, so that's where the comfort part comes into it is it's almost as important to be comfortable as it is to be suitable for, for the terrain. Size on here. So the reason I put size is a bit more important. I think everyone knows that when you're buying a pair of shoes that you want them to fit. Um, but specifically, we expect you, we, we recommend that people consider a shoe that's one or two sizes bigger than their normal shoe size. Now it's controversial to say that because some people absolutely don't agree with that. Um, but in general, I think I've seen more people having problems with shoes that are too small than shoes that are too big. When you're out there for prolonged periods of time, your feet do swell. Um, and so you having a bit more room in your shoe will help to prevent some blisters. Um, and that will help make the race more comfortable uh, and again, more likely to, to finish. For those people who are going to be out on the course for longer um, then the size of the shoe is going to have more of an impact. So for the, the people at the very front or the fast people who are going to be finishing fast, they're not on their feet for quite so long. So they have more time to, um, to rest in between and their feet will have a chance to not swell so much to start with because they're not on their feet for so long, but also to, um, to reduce in swelling. What I'm going to share with you here to put it into perspective. So the photos on the left are some shoes after um, doing a race. Specifically uh, here, most of these are from the Atacama Crossing, which is probably the, the one with the race which is harshest on shoes. It's a slightly more technical terrain. But what I was interested about, I just put this poll up on our um, unofficial Facebook group last week. And these are the results they got. So the shoes, the photos on the left are mostly hawker shoes where you can see that the soles are almost completely gone, but equally people still voted and recommended to um, wear hawkers even for the Atacama Desert. Um, 
Rita, I can see there's a lot of chat going on. Maybe you can share the link to our unofficial Facebook group just in case people haven't seen it. Because here you can see the rough idea of the results, um, but there were another um, 12 brands that were mentioned and there's also um, a lot of comments underneath. But what was fascinating is when I put this poll up there to see, um, out of 156 votes, 16 brands were, were mentioned and 50% of the votes went to the two top two brands, which were Hoka and Salomon. I am now going to move on from shoes um, and moving on to the backpack. It's a very important item because it's going to be on your back for the entire race. Um, you want it to be comfortable, you want it not to break, you want it to fit everything in it that it needs to. So the first thing to look at is the capacity. 25 litres is what I recommend. This backpack here is a 25 litre backpack. Um, it's possible to go as low as 20 litres, but I don't recommend it. And I wouldn't go above 30 litres. Comfort, you want it to fit snugly, not move along when you're running or hiking uh, and not have any pressure points anywhere and not have any straps that, um, that flap around. But most importantly, you don't want to move around when you're when you're running or, or walking. And then the three key features to look at in the backpack. How are you going to carry your water? So most people do carry it on the front, which I'll come on to in a bit. But is there a way that you can carry it on the front if that's what you want to do? Uh, if not, where would you carry it um, instead? Does it have a front pack? Do you want a front pack? Do you not want a front pack? Does it need a front pack? Um, some people like it, some people don't, and just considering that, um, both whether you want it and whether it's possible. And finally, pockets at the front. Um, you want to try and have things organised so that you don't have to take your backpack off for an entire stage. Doesn't mean that you're definitely not going to, but things that you know you're going to need to access the entire time is your water bottles to fill up at a checkpoint, um, food for the stage, sunscreen, alcohol, gel, um, and those kind of items. You want a blister kit to be close at hand, but it doesn't have to be right in your front pockets or fit there, because if you're dealing with blisters, you probably need to take your pack off. Some specific brands that I recommend based on recommendations from, from racers and, and what I've used myself, but it doesn't mean they're the only ones. The OMM, this photo here is a 25 litre. It also comes in a 32 litre. This is an easy go-to backpack, which most people like or are okay with. Very, I've met very few people who've told me they hate it, but there are people, of course, that prefer other packs. So if you're completely unsure, don't know what to go to, this is a good go-to pack. The Ultimate Direction, it comes in 25 litres and 33 litres. It's more like a running vest, so it fits normally more snugly around here. But as a result of that, it comes in two sizes as well, not just in capacity, but it has a small medium and a medium large. Um, it does also mean that Whilst they are adjustable, they're not as adjustable. So if one of those sizes doesn't fit you, then it's not the pack for you. Um, so you probably want to try it before you make that decision just to make sure it fits like you would a piece of clothing. And next one I, I um, want to bring your attention to is the WAA pack, which is a 20 litre plus five litre front pack. Um, you would almost definitely have to have the front pack because it would be it's very hard to fit everything into a 20 litre pack. Um, and it's designed specifically for the desert, so it's got a lot of very interesting features, but it's also quite complicated. So if you're not, and it's also very specific on space, so if you're not very uh, organised or you're not planning to go for the absolute lightest of most things, um, then it might not be the pack for you. But if you are, then it's a good option. Other brands, um, Raid Light, Salomon, Osprey, Raid Light's been around for a long time in desert racing. Um, and they tried a lot of different things. They work, Salomon and Osprey's a heavier pack, um, has more um, of a frame to it. So we're whizzing through here. So we're moving on to the third key item here, which is a hydration system, which is basically the water bottles um, or capacity for carrying the water or liquid. First thing you need to know is, is what the capacity for water allocation is, so you know what you need to, to be carrying. So basically, in, in summary, you get nine litres a day. 
you get 1.5 litres of water at each checkpoint. So you have to leave that checkpoint with 1.5 litres of water, which means that you want to have um, capacity for, for carrying 1.5 litres of water that's relatively easily accessible. You also have to have the ability to carry one litre extra. Um, it may be possible to take more water or it may be required, um, for example, if it's a longer section or it's a very hot section. Um, and then when you get to camp, you can have an allocation of 4.5 litres of water. That's for the rest of the day, that night, the next morning, and very important, until the first checkpoint the next day. Um, that water is now provided in large containers that you go and fill up yourself, so you don't need to be able to carry it all in one go. We're doing that so we have slightly less plastic waste. Um, but keep an eye on your allocation because it's a good recommendation of how much you should be consuming without um, drinking too much, which can also be um, dangerous. Uh, and finally on this, so in addition to that, hot water is provided at each camp for preparing meals and hot drinks. Um, as I'm going through, do look at any photos that are up here because it is really interesting to see what packs people are wearing, how they're carrying their water, what clothing they're wearing, etc. OK, still on water bottles. So the requirement in terms of the equipment list. So you have to have the uh, you have to have containers that can carry 2.5 litres of water and you have to have them on you at all times. Um, a recommendation is you have 1.5 litre capacity easily accessible um, that you can fill up from the checkpoint without having to take your pack off or dig down. And then you have one litre extra capacity um, that doesn't have to be so accessible, but for in case you are allowed or would like um, and to, to or are required to take extra water. OK, the options that we recommend in terms of these. So there's three primary options. So one is normal bottles. So these bottles I've got the photo of here are 750 ml. Uh, and you would have two of them, one on each side, carrying them in the front on the straps of your backpack. You can also carry them behind in the neck compartments, um, but in a moment I'll talk about having ease of being able to drink from them. So actually having them on your straps makes more sense unless you have them behind and you have a tube that's attached to them. Soft bottles is another option, and I'll show you a photo in a minute of somebody who's using them. Pros and cons of them, normally they come in 500 mil, which means that you'd need three of them easily accessible. Uh, the other thing is you'd have to take it out in order to drink it because it doesn't have a straw that sticks up. Um, some people really like them. I think they are lighter than normal bottles, um, which is a positive for them. The third option is the bl water bladder, which I generally don't recommend, but it doesn't mean you, you can't have it. It still meets the requirement. It's just, it's, so the plus side is it's easy to drink because you have a tube there, which encourages you to stay hydrated. The, the negative side is that you can't see how much water that you've got left. So if you're three quarters of the way through a stage or you think you're, you're three hours into, into a section um, and you think the checkpoint's near, but you can't see it, but you don't know how much, and you're thirsty, but you don't know how much water you've got, you might even want to take your pack off to then have to check it. Um, another downside of it is that normally, you have to take your pack off in order to fill it with water. And that's OK if you're planning to stop at every checkpoint. But most people try not to or at least want to have the option of not having to take your pack off every time. Um, another downside is that if you're if it's been filled up when it's inside your your pack, it's often been squashed by other things around you. And it's not always that easy to make sure that it's been filled to its full capacity. And what you don't want to be doing is leaving a checkpoint with less than the full amount. What some people do is they have their bladder as their as their extra and they'll have some water in it and then they will have a water bottle as well so they can um, have something extra so it doesn't run out. But in general, it wouldn't be re my recommendation, but if you really like them, of course, it's possible. And then finally, for the extra one litre, here's an example of something that works very well, like a platypus soft bottle. It's like a bladder, but it doesn't have the tube and it folds up very, very small. So when you're not using it, it's light and it's it's hardly noticeable, but it can fit the um, liquids in if you want it. So four important things to consider when you're looking at what um, hydration system or how to carry your water and your liquids. One is you want to have it relatively easy to drink. 
Um, so you want to have it there in your face because if you're feeling a bit tired, you're thirsty, but you're a bit tired and you have to reach behind you to get it, um, or even in a case where you have to take it out of, if you can see here, you have to take it out of its pocket and actually physically drink it. It seems like no big deal, but the more tired you get, the more little things like that make a difference. But you can see here, these two people on the right at the bottom do have soft bottles there. And on the left, he has the uh, harder bottles. Managing the amount of water I've spoken about. And then thirdly, keeping different types of liquids separate. So if you've got a, only got a bladder, you only have one container for putting liquid in. And generally, you're going to want to have a mix of water and electrolytes if you are having um, electrolytes that dissolve in water, which is probably the most popular um, combo of having it. But of course, if you're not, it doesn't matter. And potentially some liquid hydration. And sorry, ease to fill, I haven't spoken about. So a lady in the top, on the right side at the top, has very sweet and quite fun looking bottles, but with tiny little entrances for pouring water in, which means that she'll be a little longer at checkpoints as we're trying to, to, uh, to fill them up. Moving on, so this was the second category of, of items, which is items that still need to be considered, but not as much as what I call the key items. <clears throat> so the sleeping bag is here. It's probably the item that you will spend most money on, um, just because sleeping bags are expensive, and especially when you're trying to get them to be light. For most of the races, in fact, I think all of the races, the rating required is down to zero Celsius or 32 Fahrenheit. Um, and you can go a little lower than that if you want. That's normally um, sufficient for, for most of the, the deserts. Other than the fact that you want it to be um, rate to a certain rating and to a comfort level of that rating, you also want it to be small. Other than that, it doesn't matter too much about the sleeping bag. So I've put it needs to be considered because you're spending a lot of money on it and you don't want something that doesn't work or you may never use again. Um, but in terms of sleeping bag, if it's light and it meets the um, rating requirement, then that works for you. There are some things to consider on it. For example, the length, they come in different sizes and there's about 200 grams difference between a um, regular sleeping bag and a large sleeping bag. Obviously, if you're a taller um, person, you ideally would, in a normal world, you would choose a large one, but to decide whether 200 grams is worth it, uh, for not having it coming all the way up to to cover your entire body and maybe just down to here and you can huddle it round. Headlamps, so they're obviously extremely important because most people are going to be on the course in the dark, for at least for a little bit of time during the long stage. Um, and you want it to definitely work and feel like if you were on not a fully technical trail, but if you're on a, a trail that you really needed to see where you were going, um, and you were on your own and it was in the dark, that the headlamp with the headlamp you've got, you feel comfortable that it would um, help you to see what you need to see. And also um, that it doesn't move around when you're running. But again, at the end of the day, there's a million headlamps out there, um, but you don't need to spend um, weeks researching it. The same comes to clothing. It's very specific to what your your climate of the race that you're going to be um, you're going to be racing in, and also it does depend on what you like. But you run and you hike anyway, so you don't need to completely change everything on it. So of course it needs to be considered and 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 researched a little bit. Um, but it's unlikely um, that your uh, running top is going to be the reason that you don't finish the race. And finally, on your medication and your blister kit, so blisters might be the reason, um, but the blister kit itself is not, provided you have all of the uh, items that we require you to have. Um, if you get very bad blisters, you may want to, and you know you get bad blisters, you may want to research a little more. And in terms of medication, so we do require you to bring a certain amount of medication, even if you don't think you're going to use it, but just simple painkillers um, so that you have them. So again, you don't need to spend a lot of time looking for them, but you do have to bring them. So then we move on to the optional items. And if you were really trying to cut on weight, then you would say, I'm not going to have any optional items. Um, but there's a few items that I think are worth considering. So gaiters, and I'll talk about gaiters and sleeping pad a bit more in, in a moment. But if someone said to me, 
yes, no, I need an answer now, should I bring, wear gaiters? I would say yes. Sleeping pad, again, I would say yes. Trekking poles, I would say if you usually use them, then yes. If you don't usually use them, then no. Toothbrush and toothpaste, I wouldn't even consider anything. Uh, I would just bring them. Um, but there are ways of cutting down the weight even of something like that. So camp shoes, something to wear around when you finish the stage, you have to wear some form of shoe. It could just be your insole with, with, um, with a tie around it, or it could be um, a flip-flop or a croc, but generally I would say it is worth bringing them. Electronics, uh, I know a lot of people would disagree with me on this, but again, if it was a quick yes, no answer, I would say no, um, but I know it's great to have your watch and that you know how far you're going, how fast you're going and what distance you're going and where you're getting to and people love music. And of course the camera is going to be well worth it for the photos you take, but we don't provide chargers. So whatever electronics you bring, you have to bring a device or a means for charging them. And every bit of the, the electronics weighs, adds up quite a lot. So maybe not the watch on its own, but thinking about how to find a watch that doesn't need charging or minimal charging is becomes challenging. Uh, and then other things here, so a sports bra for the women, um, an eating bowl, thinking about how you're going to manage your food may well be worth it. And extra food above the 14,000 calories is definitely worth considering, but within reason. So I talk here a little bit more now about gaiters because they are quite key. There's three main type of gaiters. There's um, number one here, which is the short gaiters. You can see it in the top left corner, hopefully you can see it. And these, you have Velcro permanently on your shoe um, and then you have Velcro on the gaiter and you put the gaiter on like a sock and then you pull it down over the um, shoe and attach it to the Velcro. So you could choose one stage have it, one stage don't. I would say if you're gonna wear them, wear them because then you don't have to carry them they're not very heavy, but every little counts. And also you can get things, uh, debris and the like stuck in the Velcro so they don't stick as well if you're not using them all the time. They're pretty good in the sand um, and they're definitely good for, for dust and, and small debris and small stones. Um, you can see at the top, there's no way of anything getting in, but because they are Velcro, it is possible for small things to creep in from underneath. Gator number two is a full gator and you can see it in the bottom left. It doesn't look so full there because it's permanently attached to her shoe. And then you have to put your foot inside the shoe um, and do the laces up inside the gaiter before you pull it up. So for very sandy races, it's it's probably the, the it's the one I would recommend most because it definitely gives the most coverage of preventing sand getting into it. But it's permanently there for the whole race um, and, and it's until you could cut it off afterwards, but pretty much forever. And then finally is call the trail runner gator so this isn't permanently attached anywhere no velcro uh, nothing but it only protects at the top of the shoe so to stop debris getting in around your ankle if you have a shoe that has a lot of mesh um, and especially if you're on a sandy course i don't recommend this one because it won't offer any protection on top here um, but if you have and, and salamons are pretty good for this if you have a shoe that doesn't have that much mess mesh they will stop sand getting in over the top Specifically for each of the races, the mid race, I would recommend number two. It's quite a, it's the most sandy of all of them. And so it's worth having full coverage. Gobi March has some sand and a lot of the tracks and trails are dusty with debris, but not full sand um, for more than one stage. And therefore I'd probably recommend it number one or number three. Um, I would go for number one if I was pushed, but either are okay, provided you don't have too much mesh. For the Atacama Crossing, I'd re recommend either one or two. There is a lot of sand there, but there's also some non-sandy bits and the, the um, terrain can cut, the, the tall gaiters are quite lightweight and it can tear them on the side, hence one or two, not just two. Uh, and for Georgia, it's not particularly a sandy race at all, it's mainly on trails, and so actually number three would work for that. Um, moving on to sleeping pads, which is another um, optional item, 90% of people um, bring one and probably it's probably these days it's probably more than 90% of people. Sleep is very important. They protect against the hard ground uh, and also the cold ground. 
but they do definitely add a significant amount of weight. Um, there's two main types of them if you are deciding to go ahead with them. One is the inflatable type, which you can see up here in the top left, and one is the folding type you can see down here in the bottom left. Uh, comparisons, so the inflatable one folds down very small and you can fit it into your pack easily. The folding one is very bulky, it's not heavier, but it's very bulky, so you generally have to have it on the outside of your pack, which you can see here. Um, as long as you have an, a way of attaching it, it's not an issue, but it's nicer to plan not to have things on the outside. Um, the inflatable one, you have to inflate it and deflate it each day. It doesn't take that much, but again, every extra bit that you have to do when you've got in from a long day or when you are getting ready in the morning, um, it, it can add a little extra hassle, but it's no big deal, but it's something to consider, whereas the folding one simply folds up. The inflatable ones, they can get a puncture, uh, and if they do, um, you either have to fix it or it's no longer um, any use. Whereas the, the fold up one is a little thinner, um, but it won't puncture. The inflatable one, it's just to know rather than to consider, but it can be quite noisy to sleep on, a bit like turning over on a crisp packet, whereas the folding one is very quiet, but the weight for both of them is similar. And that's something you need to weigh up um, based on uh, what works for you in your pack and what you prefer in terms of inside your pack, outside your pack, taking the risk of a puncture and having the time and effort to Put it up each night. What you will see up here in the top uh, left, you'll see that they come in different sizes. If you're going with an inflatable one, I would highly recommend that you go with a small size, even if you're quite tall, um, or even a medium size, but not to cover the comfort of your entire body, but at least for your from your shoulders to your hips, um, which is the most part of your body that's going to be um, touching the ground and going to feel the cold the worst. And the same with the folding one at the bottom left, you can cut some of these bits off to make them um, smaller so they, you have the basic comfort, but not full comfort or full weight. So that brings me to the end of the equipment that I'm gonna talk through. And I know it's a bit of a rush, um, but there is so much to say about every item that I wanted to cover the most important parts of the most important items to start with. So I'm now gonna move on to the topics about um, how to go lighter and top tips for generally choosing your equipment. So I'm not gonna tell you anything here that is rocket science that's going to change your way of thinking, but it's more putting down into thoughts things that you will know, um, but just making sure that you do it. So number one is to research the lightest of every item, at least so you know what the, the lightest option is and then ask those questions about it. Um, does it meet the requirements? It might be very light and it might be a sleeping pad, but it, um, it may not meet other requirements uh, that you need. That was probably a bad example, but thinking of, say, a waterproof jacket, it may be very light and it may consider itself waterproof, but waterproof materials, if they're very thin, if they touch your skin or they touch another item, um, then you will feel the water um, coming through. So there's a balance on it, but research the lightest of every item so you know what your lightest option is. So when you go down for something that suits you, you know um, how far off from the absolute lightest that you could have would be. Weigh every item. Don't just take what it tells you on the packet, actually weigh it and list it all out so you know how much uh, everything is weighing and where your big items um, are, where you might be able to make a small saving on. Remove as much packaging as possible. So this goes down to the labels inside your, inside your clothes, um, inside your sleeping bag, especially there's a label that's about that size. It, it probably doesn't even weigh a gram, but you take out four of those and it does weigh a gram or a couple of grams and it all adds up. And I say use your equipment as packaging. So if there's anything that needs to be protected, use your socks to, to, um, to put it in your spare socks so that it doesn't get damaged or bashed around or whatever it is, but don't add extra uh, packaging that's not doesn't have another use. Review all of your optional items and reconsider if you really need them, really want them. Um, we just spoke through some of them that are worth definitely considering. Um, but here's an example on this. So for socks, we require you to bring two pairs. Um, in a normal world, you would expect to have seven pairs of socks for seven days and maybe even more if you're going on a hiking trip where you knew you might have water crossings. But a pair of socks on average weighs about 30 grams. 
So as soon as you have um, four pairs of socks, you're doubling the, the weight that you have. Now you are able to throw things away. Um, and whilst we don't want to encourage waste, your socks are not going to be that much, um, they're not going to be so pleasant after they've been through, through the desert. So maybe you want to consider having a couple of extra socks, but then you're not going to carry them all the way out with you afterwards. Um, okay, so those are my list of uh, tips on how to go lighter. Here's some sort of did you know items um, on here. I mean, you will know by the time you start the race, you're likely to know how much a safety pin weighs, how much a Ziploc bag weighs. A toothbrush um, is normally around average around 20 grams. If you cut the handle off, you can make that 15 grams. That's quite a big saving there for something that you really didn't don't don't didn't need the extra handle for. It's a comfort item, not not a required item. And here the sleeping bag example is 200 grams or so, not always, but with some sleeping bags between a regular and a large size, maybe you want to consider um, a little bit of discomfort with the regular. An external charger here, now you probably can get them a little lighter than this these days, but 200 grams for charging for, for what is basically luxury, um, not a requirement, is something that you may want to reconsider if you're trying to cut weight. Okay, some key resources for equipment, um, and I will send around an email after this. I've now worked out how to um, how to see the full attendees and get the um, email addresses of those of you that ha have actually registered them. And I will send this this list with links to you. Um, but some key things. So the equipment list that I've spoken about, just because it has so much detail on there about options and descriptions of what it is. So make sure you read it um, fully and in detail, not just the first page at least once. The Racing the Planet store, and I only put this in there because um, most of the items sold on there that are relevant for the races have either been recommended or endorsed by past racers. So it means that they've been through uh, a desert race, obviously not the specific item you're buying, um, but the items that are sold there. So if you're at a loss and you don't know um, where to go or where to get it or what, what you're looking for, the items recommended there probably help. And for anybody who is actually doing a race, um, there is a 15% discount on most items there. Um, our expert articles, so there's a section on the website that has expert articles. Um, I've also just added an FAQ for equipment that has 32 frequently asked questions, a lot which have been covered in this talk, um, but not all of them have. Again, I'll send you the link to that. Um, uh, but also has things like how to like choosing a pack, finding the right shoe for you, um, choosing trekking poles. If you were thinking about it, it's definitely worth considering that um, and, and other useful uh, articles there. I said this before um, in the last session, I said again here, past races are your best source of everything. Also, remember to take everything that they say with a um, sense of caution about whether it's suitable for you. But they've been through it. They've tried it. They've tested it. They've learned the lessons. Um, so use their experience. And again, if you don't know anybody who's done a race before, but want to speak to someone, um, then I am happy to connect you. And finally, on here is um, photos. Saying as we're going through this, looking at the photos of what people are wearing, what caps they're wearing, what gaiters they're wearing, which race they're doing. Uh, are there lots of people with poles? How are they using their poles? What backpacks they have? All of those kind of things you can see in the photos. So next time you, you look through the, the photos, you will get some inspiration, but you'll also be able to look and see um, what people le learn a lot about their equipment at the same time. So I'm gonna finish here with some of my top tips um, before we move on to the Q&A. So the first thing here is test every item, even the general items, even the ones that seem very simple, just test them and make sure that they work and put them through their paces. If you can, fill your pack as close as possible with, your, um, with the equipment you're going to use so you can also feel how it fits in there and then test each, each item um, in, in the field, ideally. The heavier your pack, the harder the race. Of course, the lighter the pack, the hungrier or the colder you're likely to be, so balance it out. Every gram counts. So little things like cutting the handle off your toothbrush, cutting labels out of your clothing, taking food out of its packaging, 
um, which by the way is fine to do before the equipment check but not fine to, or not recommended to do before you get into the country because customs are generally not so keen on seeing um, plastic bags full of white powders or strange looking freeze-dried uh, meal contents. Um, if it doesn't fit in then you probably have too much and need to rethink an item. Um, so if you can't fit everything in when you're doing a, a pack you need to, to think about it a little more. And my final one, which is not to do with the race selection, sorry, the equipment selection, but um, carry all of your, or as much of your race equipment as you can as hand luggage when you travel to the race. Um, having spent all of these weeks, months, um, years in some cases, researching and finding the right piece of equipment for you, if you then get onto a plane and you check in your bag and your bag gets lost, normally not forever, but often till after the race starts, um, then you're starting from, from step one again and it just causes a lot of extra stre unnecessary stress. So carry your race equipment as hand luggage. So that brings me to the end of my part. Um, it's a lot of talking, I apologize. And I still didn't get to cover everything that I'd like to, but I hope it's given you a good um, overview. And now I'll open it up. I see there's a lot of chat messages going on. I'll open it up for you to ask questions publicly or as I said, for those more experienced people to share their top tips um, from what they've learned. I, I had a question about why such a large waterproof bag, 35 liters? So that is to line the inside of your backpack. And the reason we need, we ask you to have that is because we've had over the years, a number of people whose uh, sleeping bag or warm clothes get wet either with sweat or with rain in some of the races, or when you've been going through a river crossing and they get splashed or even someone trips into the river crossing. And what you don't want is a wet sleeping bag. The reason we say 35 liters is because it will line the entire size of your backpack. We're starting to be a little bit more lenient on that if you are having a backpack where it doesn't work with 35 liters, but you still need to have a bag inside there that will keep all the contents dry. Yeah, you know, that's what I was wondering. If you, know, you could get all of your gear into like a 32 in your bag would you let that pass? We would let it pass as long as it really does fit in and it does, does up well. Okay. Um, when, when we start making exceptions and everyone's like, well, what about this? What about this? What about this? And it's also the fact that everyone has almost the same things that everyone is, is reasonably equal. But of course, it doesn't make sense to have a 32 litre bag inside your um, 20 litre backpack, which you're going to try and fit everything inside. So a tiny bit of leniency, yes. Um, but not much. Any other questions? Rita, was there anything in the chat that's worth sharing with everyone? There are, yeah, just lots of questions and really good questions. And thanks also for, I have to say, for the alumni of, of commenting and giving your tips as well. So, Maybe if you guys want to do what you can do is save the chat for yourself to look look through later as well. There was one, uh, I we all did our best to answer the questions, but there was one comment from, and let me see, there was a question whether there can be an additional session about how to pack your bag, um, which we can comment on. Yeah, no, absolutely. So I do have a video um, that we've put together wasn't me so you won't have to listen to my voice again but showing each of the equipment items and the next one we'll do is how to pack them in and show you how to um how to do that i can touch on it briefly here you'll only be able to know for sure how you're packing your bag once you have most of your items and also a way to replicate the items that you don't have so for example your food if you're repackaging it into a different or planning to repackage it into a different size you're not going to know exactly the weight and size of it before you um, get to the race itself and you do want to practice packing before then. So when you get to a certain point before the race with all the equipment that you've got and then some say a packet of rice that might um, give an idea of a weight and size of what your food for one day is going to be. So maybe a hundred, just trying to think what, what size, a 500 gram um, packet of rice will cover a couple of days equivalent so that you can actually really move it around and see what it looks like. There's certain key things about packing your bag is that each morning you're probably gonna, gonna have to repack it but you don't wanna repack everything. So putting at the bottom the food for later on in the week and packaging the food by day 
rather than just having all of the food in together. So it keeps you more disciplined and makes it easier um, when you're getting out to, to eat it. But the food for later in the week can go at the bottom. Um, and then your sleeping bag or the, th the, the clothes that you don't wear during the day can go um, after that. And then the items that you're likely to want to access either during the day or when you very first get to the, um, to the camp in the evening um, or the afternoon. The emergency items also don't need to be at the top, but you do need to know where they go. And I highly recommend compression sacks for compartmentalizing certain items and also for crushing things down to make them as small as they possibly can to fit everything in. Um, but on the packing, I will do a video on it um, and I could even try and consider it as a Zoom call, but it's something you need to sort of see um, to, to um, have it make sense. Okay, um, I'm going to put you on the spot, Howard. Do you want to share with us your top tip for um, equipment from all the races that you've done? A couple of things about packs. Pack being light and uh, narrow, not wide, mm -hmm. uh, especially when you have your, uh, your, your uh, sleeping pad on the bottom. Some people put them horizontal on the bottom and that uh, will scrape all over the place. Uh, better to put it vertical on the side. Um, also, uh, arm warmers. Um, I find those to be great for regulating your temperature day and night. And also when uh, you uh, start running through uh, grass that cuts your legs or cactus, uh, it's good to put them on your legs and, and cover, cover them up to protect them. Uh, also adds another layer um, of warmth if you need it on your arms or your legs. Uh, so that's a couple of tips of view of all of your gear as well as uh, all of your, uh, your, your, your food. And you can kind of look at it, you know, over the time, over the days, come up with your total number of calories. So give that a shot. So you can see behind there in how it's um, behind his photos, I think you can see is his spreadsheet. And that one is his calories. Um, and I imagine you have another one for all of your gear. So he's written it down day by day. And it, it's, a, it's a good idea to do this as you're selecting each of the items, to put it into a spreadsheet and said, know your weight, weigh everything. In terms of this with, with food, know your food, know the calories uh, and split it out each day with the weight as well so that you can manage both of those at the same time. Does anybody else have any, any questions in addition to those, all those that have been asked in the chat itself? Hi, Sam. Hi, Carlos. Ah. How are you? <laughs> so Carlos is the one who has done the video of all of the equipment, which I'm going to have up on YouTube um, in the next few days, which will complement this talk where he's actually showing you each piece of equipment. And um, you can apply the logic that I've spoken about today to the reality of what he's, um, what he's recommended for each of the items. Yeah, no, uh, I just wanted to say a couple of things. Uh, one, you said it uh, more or less, but I, I, I think it's absolutely important uh, for everybody to know, to understand how your mind has to work when, when you are preparing the backpack. And that means that many people, what they do is that they, they put on the table or on the bed, like all the equipment that they are going to be using during the race, and then get a, get a backpack that can fit all that equipment. And I think it's important to understand that this is the opposite. You should uh, buy the, the, the backpack and then whatever doesn't get in that backpack, you, you, you won't need it. So you, uh, besides the mandatory equipment, but everybody's like uh, putting a lot of things in, on the table and then, you know, uh, tape recorder and <laughs> all kinds of crazy things, but then they doesn't fit in your backpack. So then you buy a bigger backpack. No, that is not the idea because at the end you will end up with 20 kilos, which is crazy, no? And, and a very important thing that I think is, is uh, to consider is that uh, you should avoid uh, cutting edges next to the backpack and you should avoid the the things inside the backpack to move and when you run that can 
deal to uh, to breaking your backpack or having a cut or something. So it's uh, and it's not comfortable to run when the things are like bouncing up and down for for 250 kilometers. So uh, all of the backpacks they they normally have this uh, like tension uh, straps in the back. Use them because it's very very important to have everything very very tight. Okay. Yeah, excellent, excellent advice. Hisham did the Grand Slam a couple of years ago. Um, is there any top tips you want to share with with those who who have longer time to to stay here? Oh, <laughs> that's a, that's a big one. But uh, hi everyone, I did the Grand Slam in two thousand eighteen. Uh, I mean, the tip is that um, I remember the the first race was in Namibia. I start with uh, you know the the mind that I'm going to, to run fast and I'm going to, 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 to be on the top 10 finisher, you know, type of things, you know, and you quickly realize that uh, you really need to, to remove that from your mind and enjoy just uh, the, the moment, enjoy the, let's, the landscape and, uh, you know, and uh, just, run, just run to be happy, you know. So it's really about being happy and uh, feeling the landscape and uh, making friends at the camp. It's really all about that around this, uh, this experience because I consider that like a big, big experience for me. So from Namibia to Antarctica, it was just like a, like a family, uh, family founding all together, you know? So I would say, enjoy, enjoy a lot. Do not put too much pressure on your mind. Have a great purpose on doing it. And uh, that's it. So really it's all about enjoying and being in the, in the moment, yeah. Run high and, and run slow. That's it. That's, that's good advice, not on equipment, but in general. Remember to enjoy it, not just uh, the process of measuring every gram or every um, step or every part of pain along the way. I'm aware now that it's, it's we're five minutes over. I'm happy for other people to share their tips because both those from Howard and Carlos were, were excellent. Um, but I also don't want to keep everyone longer. So I say thank you very much to, to everyone for attending. I hope you found it useful. Um, do provide feedback if there's something that else you wanted to know or um, let me know any questions or you want to have a separate, a separate call to talk in more detail through any, through any part of the equipment or what we spoke about today.